So we now move on to another uh, sensation, which is taste. So the next two, which are taste and olfaction, are a little, you know, not as extensive as we did with the eye. And then the ear, again, is an, a more extensive kind of sensation. And as I was telling some students, here's where, with all of these, you have to make sure that you don't compartmentalize what you've been studying. So, uh, you know, you did the brain first, like you did the nervous tissue, and then you did the central nervous system where you were looking at the brain and, um, you know, the cerebral lobes, and you were looking at cerebellum, and you looked at functions there, right, of, of each of the lobes. Uh, then you moved on to peripheral nervous system where you looked at cranial nerves. So you were doing functions of those cranial nerves. And now you're actually using some of those functions of those cranial nerves. For example, like when we, we just finished with vision, right? So if you look at it this way, we did, uh, when we were looking at vision, um, the lobe that is responsible for vision is the occipital lobe. So occipital lobe was the lobe which was responsible for vision. And even then, remember, it was the field of vision, right? The right occipital lobe controls the left field of vision. Then when we, so this was in the brain. Then when we looked at cranial nerves, which was the cranial nerve which was concerned with vision? Which one? There's no occipital nerve. Oh, nerve. Nerve, cranial nerve. Green. No. <laughs> We're just guessing now. Just tell us. <laughs> optic. Remember from the retina, the optic nerve, the optic disc, right? We talked about the optic nerve is the nerve for vision. Second cranial nerve, right? Optic nerve. Rem remember that? And then we looked at the sense of vision where we did the eyeball. And, you know, we, in the eyeball, we looked at the layers. And in the layers, remember, we mentioned the retina. And in the retina were those photoreceptors, rods and cones, which we talked about and how cones were concentrated in the macula lutea and the fovea centralis and the rods were peripheral. Cones were for color vision and all that. And where did those cones, they went, they synapsed and went into ganglion cells, which led to the optic nerve. So optic disc, remember that, right? So can you see, we're kind of going in a reverse direction. So we started here, right, in the brain, and then we talked of cranial nerves and their functions, and now we are talking about, you know, this part, right, like here, okay? So this is where I want you to try and correlate these things, and I've kind of put it in these PowerPoints, and uh, these PowerPoints give you a synopsis of, what is there in your notes. So read every sentence in your notes and in these PowerPoints also very, very carefully. So similarly, let's look at taste. So the first thing I want you to look at in taste is that, first of all, if we look at which lobe is responsible for taste, which lobe of the brain is responsible for taste? The gustatory cortex, yes, but it is in which lobe? Because a taste, another word for taste is gustation or gustatory region. Parietal. parietal, yes. So the parietal lobe, okay, and also a part which was, if I remember, I said there was something called the insula, which was embedded inside those lobes. So we'll start here. So parietal lobe, so, you, you know, this is a good way of reviewing what are the functions of the lobes. One of the functions of the parietal lobe was taste. So parietal lobe and insula, so that's what is here. Then nerves which carry to this parietal lobe, so I should really should have my arrow going the other way, which are the nerves which carry taste? Yes, 7, 9, and 10. So you see that over here, taste carried by 7, 9, and 10th cranial nerve. So on the functions of cranial nerve, for 7th cranial nerve, one of the functions is to carry taste from the anterior two-thirds. Ninth cranial nerve, one of its functions is to carry Taste from the posterior one-third and tenth is from the posterior most part. And then taste is carried from the tongue. So now today what we are going to look at is the tongue and what are the structures in the tongue, okay? So all of this is actually given here. So if you look here, you can see the taste is carried by seven, ninth and tenth cranial nerves to the parietal lobe and the insula. So on the surface of the tongue, what are the actual receptors responsible for taste? 
on the surface of the tongue we have these projections which are known as papillae <clears throat> um, there are three <coughs> excuse me there are three main papillae which have taste buds in them taste buds are the main receptors the ones which can help you to perceive taste so these projections or papillae the three types we have are fungi form which are a little bit mushroom like like a fungus foliate no special kind of um, you know shape and then circumvallate you'll see that these are more rounded papillae so these are the three which have taste buds in them we have other papillae which are present on the surface of the tongue they are present everywhere these are called filiform these are spike like you know straight like that they do not have taste buds so i haven't mentioned them here they are kind of more for um giving roughness to your tongue and you know they help like you know when you lick an ice cream cone you know that that thing that helps you to kind of really take a good sweep of that cone that's what these filiform papillae help now of these papillae the circumvallate papillae are really large they are present between the at the junction between the anterior two thirds and the posterior one third of the tongue so if we were to draw the tongue like this okay this is anterior and this is posterior so this is where the circumvallate will be present and all of these three types of papillae have taste buds in them and we'll look at we'll look at a description of the taste buds these taste buds they have special cells which are the receptor cells so because it has to do with taste the cells are known as gustatory cells and they actually have little hairs on them and those hairs are the ones which get stimulated whenever some food goes and sort of in a solution form and you kind of put it on your tongue that's what stimulates these gustatory hairs which then go you know to the gustatory cell which lead to the nerves the 7th 9th or 10th cranial nerves which will finally take it to the parietal lobe and the insula and also we have cells next to these gustatory cells which are like supporting cells these are known as basal cells and again we'll see them in the in the image and these basal cells kind of help they regenerate you know help in regeneration because these taste these gustatory hairs can be destroyed when you eat something really or drink something really hot or eat eat something really hot they, that can do that is there a time or a condition which would cause those cells to be permanently damaged or not well i mean if you burn your tongue with, uh, with heat or something like that could be that it could be permanently damaged or if your salivary um or if or, yes it's it's very very rare that um uh, even if all of your salivary glands for some reason were totally damaged you have enough uh, what are called buccal glands which are present which will still produce saliva and keep your uh, you know thing moist but if you blot your tongue at any particular time and put something on your tongue and the ta- because in order to perceive taste it has to be in a solution form so then you cannot taste anything um then the basic taste sensations are you know these five sweet sour bitter salty you all know about that and then umami is a special kind of a taste which helps you to detect flavor you know like a juicy steak is one example you can kind of dis, uh, you know get those flavors inside it helps you to taste the monosodium glutamate even the uh, msg you know so it was discovered by the japanese previously they used to kind of assign specific areas for uh, the different types of taste for example they they would tell you that the back was for bitter the front was you know salty sweet and all of that but now they find that it's kind you cannot really localize it as they used to do it earlier um these gustatory cells again they are replaced every 7 to 10 days and it is these basal cells which kind of help to replace them and taste and smell are highly correlated In, when you have a bad cold you all know you are not able to taste your food you know so they say actually taste is 80% smell so you know you just smell the odor you can almost taste it even before it has come come on your tongue so they are very very highly correlated so let's look at a little bit on taste If you can't smell, you probably can't taste very well either. They are closely related functions. 
receptor cells for taste and smell are located in the mouth and nose, respectively. As the receptor cells are stimulated, and impulse are absorbed to the brain's smelling and tasting centers in the cortices. For taste, impulse is stimulated by a chemical compound, the gustatory cortex. For smells, impulse is stimulated by chemical compounds in odors are sent to the olfactory cortex. Brain forms a memory so that it can recall the odors the next time they are present. So this shows you the relationship. Remember, we said there are fibers all over in the inter. You are so smell taste. You know, you think that you smell before you automatically almost begin to taste that. Okay. So here it shows you all of these structures that I was talking about. So let's first look at the gross surface of the tongue. So here is the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, and this is the posterior one-third, and this here is the posterior most part of the tongue. Do not confuse this area here as having taste, but this is because of lymphatic tissue present under the skin, which kind of raises these bumps, so that's known as lingual tonsil. So here on the surface of the tongue, on most of the surface, you have these fungiform papillae, which are uh, more, uh, like I said, um, uh, fung uh, mushroom shaped. Uh, we also have filiform, those, you know, ones which give roughness to your tongue. But these fungiform are the one which contain taste buds. Then we have foliate papillae, which are present, as you can see, mainly on the sides of the tongue. These also have taste buds. And then at the junction between this anterior two thirds up here, and the posterior one-third. So the junction of this area, which is the anterior two-thirds, and this part, which is the posterior one-third. So between there and that area, you have these uh, papillae, which are called valate papillae, are also known as circumvallate papillae, these ones here. They are the fewest. And these circumvallate papillae, so here's an, uh, a picture showing you a circumvallate papilla. So what it is, it's kind of a rounded papilla, which lies in a deep sort of an indentation. There's like a moat surrounding it. And in the walls over here is where you have the taste buds. So when food comes in, that food actually drops down. So it kind of drops down here where, you know, the saliva makes it into a solution form and that's how it kind of will stimulate these taste buds which are the hairs which are present and then that will be carried to the um, gustatory cortex. So here let's look at a typical taste bud. So if you look at the taste bud up here, you can see these cells here which are known as the gustatory cells and they have these little hairs which open into an area called the gustatory pore or taste pore and that's where the fluid filled solution will come in and kind of stimulate it. On either, I mean, on the sides of these, you have these basal cells, and these basal cells are the ones which help to replenish these gustatory cells. When these gustatory hairs are stimulated, they go to the, the impulses carried to the cell, which then goes into the cranial nerve fiber, depending on whether it's the anterior two-thirds or posterior one-third or the posterior most part. From here, you can see here ninth, um, seventh, ninth and tenth. So these three cranial nerves will carry it all the way, you know, synapsing along the way. They'll go and synapse in the gustatory cortex, which is in the insula, as well as in the parietal lobe. So here you can see the entire pathway. And so sometimes it is possible to lose the sense of taste only in a certain area. So imagine if the seventh cranial nerve was damaged for some reason. So you would not, if you put anything on this front part of the tongue on that side, you would not be able to taste, but anything on the back, you would still be able to taste. So you can actually individually lose sensation of taste along any particular pathway, uh, you know, part of the tongue. So let's look at this. What type of neurons do you think taste buds would be connected to? Remember, we talked of the different types of neurons and where we would find them. Oops. 
Okay, it would be bipolar. Remember, any bipolar neurons were found in sense organs. We did this earlier. Special sense organs like vision, retina, you find bipolar neurons. Taste, you find bipolar neurons. Smell in the olfactory epithelium, which we'll do next, you'll find bipolar neurons. Then in the ear, which is to do with both hearing and uh, with uh, equilibrium, again, you'll find bipolar. Pseudo-unipolar neurons are present, if you remember, in that dorsal root ganglia or sensory ganglia. You remember that? That was attached to the dorsal root of the spinal cord. And multipolar neurons are present within the central nervous system. That's the where most of the multipolar neurons are present. And also in the autonomic ganglia, because autonomic ganglia were to do with the motor system. Okay? So remember, bipolar is to do with sense organs. And I think I asked this question earlier when we were doing the eye. So again, remember, sense organs is where you find bipolar neurons, okay? And if you actually look back on this slide here, so notice here, this this kind of cell, it's really a bipolar neuron. I mean, it doesn't, sh this doesn't show you that well, so maybe not. But yes, they, the bipolar neurons are what are present in the special sense organs, okay? The next sense is the sense of smell. So here, the sense of smell will be, is seen in the nose. It's seen in the roof of the nose. So it's only a small area in the roof of the nasal cavity and the kind of adjacent part um, of the septum. So if I was looking at the nose from, if you're looking at someone's nasal cavity from in front, you know, if I'm looking at it in front, so this is the septum of the nose, right? So this is one nasal cavity and this is one. So let's say this is the right and this is the left side, okay? Your olfactory epithelium is only present so this part here would be the floor of the nose, right? This part is the roof. The olfactory epithelium is just present here in the roof of the nose, just a small area, so way up there, okay? So that's where the olfactory epithelium is. Next, again, can you notice bipolar neurons? So they, the receptors are actually the nerve cells themselves. The nerve, you don't have like in, in the sense in... In the case of taste, remember you have those special gustatory cells, right? Here it is the nerve cells themselves which are the olfactory receptors. So with the result, they actually can get damaged quite easily. Because if you, so that's why they tell you not to inhale pungent fumes or anything like that. Because that can destroy these olfactory uh, nerve cells, you know, the endings. But the good thing is that they regenerate every two months. So that's, you know, that's one of the ways. So people who work in factories where they have to deal a lot with pungent fumes, they usually have to wear masks. Uh, or even people who kind of deal with, um, you know, like working in funeral homes. And most of the time they wear masks. But if they don't, those pungent formal formaldehyde can actually destroy that. You had a question? That happened to you? Yes, it comes back, which is a good thing. But yes, you know, so you, you can't smell, and that thing is called anosmia when you can't smell. So that's why, you know, we, we always say, you know, they'll have these label warnings on, on things which can which send off these strong fumes. Uh, the other thing about the olfactory, so one thing in the olfactory, um, in all sense of olfaction is that first is you have this tiny area in the roof of the nose. The second is that the nerve... Uh, nerves itself, the olfactory nerves, they themselves act as receptors. And the third one is that the olfactory nerve, like you had, you had one optic nerve, one for each side and one oculomotor for each side and so on. But olfactory, actually, you do not have one nerve, one right and one left. You, we actually have many olfactory nerves. So the nerves are really, they form bundles. So they are about 20 bundles, you know. And those bundles actually pierce the cribriform plate of the ethmoid. So they go through the nose. So again, if I drew the no nasal cavity like this, they pass through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid. And then they synapse on a structure which is called the olfactory bulb. So they'll synapse there. And then another neuron will start from there and it will be carried by the olfactory tract. And this olfactory tract will go all the way to which lobe of the brain is responsible for smell? Temporal lobe, right? So here, can you see temporal lobe, first cranial nerve is carrying it, and its sense of smell. 
Okay, so smell is carried by the first cranial nerve. So function of the first cranial nerve is smell. And where is smell perceived? Temporal lobe. So temporal lobe has many functions. So you can see here one of them is smell. Then later you'll see another one would be hearing. And then it had also that Wernicke's sensory speech area. So a lot of functions. Uh, the olfactory area is also connected to another part of the brain which is called the limbic system. The limbic system is to do with our emotional uh, responses. So sometimes, you know, when you smell something really bad um, or certain smells kind of bring, bring out some emotional responses in, in, in certain people, you know. Uh, just to give you an example, um, if you go into a funeral home, for example, right, you know, the, the typical smell that comes from that funeral home, you get, you, you know, some people kind of react a little bit too emotionally to that. So that, again, is because of these connections between these sensations and this limbic system. So here is showing you the olfactory pathway. So this area, notice this is, this part here is the roof of the nasal cavity. So here are these many bundles of these olfactory nerves. They pass through this cribriform plate of the ethmoid. So this, what they're piercing through is the cribriform the cribriform plate of the ethmoid which you can see here. So here's a magnified picture. So you can see this cribriform plate of the ethmoid. And notice because the roof of the nose is so high up, what happens is that sometimes when you're not able to smell, it makes it easier if you sniff at something. You kind of sniff deeply. When you do that, what happens is you kind of draw the, the smell, the odor, into the to come in close contact with the roof of the nose. And that stimulates these nerve endings, which, which is why you know, you're able to smell. So here you can see these are the neurons, the olfactory neurons, and these are its endings and they kind of form the receptors. Then these form many bundles as you can see here. These bundles pass through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid, go and synapse in the olfactory bulb. From there, second neurons start and form a tract which goes to the temporal lobe of the brain, which is where sense of smell is perceived. Okay? So not too much to do with... Um, not too much in um, taste and smell. Then we come to the ear. Now just like the eye, the ear also is a complicated structure. So it has three parts to it and each part is separated from the other by certain structures. So the three parts are the external, middle, and internal ear, also known as inner ear. All three parts are concerned with hearing because in order to go to the inner ear, you have to pass through the external, through the middle, get to the inner, internal ear, right? So all three parts are concerned with hearing and the nerve which carries hearing is the eighth cranial nerve, vestibular cochlear, but it is the cochlear part. So it's the cochlear part of the eighth cranial nerve. And which lobe of the brain will is hearing go to? Temporal. temporal, yes. So it goes to the temporal lobe. The in only the inner ear is concerned with maintaining balance, which is known as equilibrium. And this is carried by what is called the vestibular part of the eighth nerve. That's why it's called vestibular cochlear. Cochlear is for hearing. The way you're going to remember, cochlear is the one which has an H in it. So the H for hearing. Okay. This is the vestibular part. And this equilibrium goes to which part of the brain? Cerebellum. Very good. Cerebellum. Yes. So this goes to the cerebellum. So you can see how the eighth cranial nerve is linked to two parts, one to the temporal lobe of the brain and one to the cerebellum, okay? Now in the external ear, you can see some of the features of the external ear. The outer part is known as, and I, better than that, let me kind of, you can read this. Let me show it to you, sorry. Let me actually show it to you here. So this external ear has this part, which is known as the auricle or the ear, this area made up of uh, elastic cartilage. 
when we did cartilage, you remember we talked about it. It has different parts in it and everybody's ear is shaped a little bit uh, differently. Uh, this part of the ear, this is this area which is called the lobule. This is the part which only has fat, so there's no cartilage. This is the area where traditionally people wore earrings. Now I know you can wear it everywhere. So, but this is the area where, you know, they traditionally kind of wore earrings. And this pinna leads into a narrow canal, which is known as the external acoustic meatus, or also called the external auditory canal or external auditory meatus. So the other word for it is auditory is to do with hearing. So it's also known as the external auditory canal or meatus. Okay. Also, what I want you to see in this is that this blue represents cartilage. So part of this external auditory canal is cartilaginous and then it becomes bony. So this part here is bony. So where this cartilage and bone meet, this area here, where cartilage and bone meet, that area is the narrowest part of the external auditory canal and this area is known as the isthmus and you'll find many times in many places in the body wherever something is called isthmus not necessarily always but whenever something is called the isthmus usually quite narrow so this area where cartilage and bone meet this area is called isthmus and this is the area where foreign bodies typically tend to get stuck so you know any little thing kind of goes, tries to get into the ear because this is narrow. That's where foreign bodies get impacted or stuck. Also seen in this external auditory canal are modified glands, which are known as ceruminous glands, and they produce something called cerumen or wax. And wax has a protective function because it prevents, you know, foreign bodies from going in, like insects and other things from going in. So... Um, but sometimes whenever there's a wax buildup, you can understand that if wax builds up, what it can do is it can kind of block this whole year. So what will happen? Sound waves will come here, but they cannot go through, right? So with the result, the person will not be able to hear from that year. So they're really deaf, but it's a very simple case of just removing that wax. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, yes. this, these glands called ceruminous glands ceruminous glands and another interesting thing to do with wax is that um, the ear is supplied by the fifth cranial nerve but also the tenth cranial nerve the vagus it supplies a part of the ear along the floor of the ear the vagus nerve supplies this is just for out of interest you don't really need to write this down and sometimes when you know people have wax in the ear or there is a foreign body which is impacted and you need to kind of get the foreign body out um, you can't kind of go digging inside the ear because if you go too deep, you might injure this tympanic membrane. So what you do is you do something known as syringing of the ear. So what you do is you kind of with a, a little syringe, you just push in fluid and the fluid goes in and it kind of creates a little pressure and, you know, the wax kind of is sort of brought out with it or the foreign body just kind of flows out with it. So when you syringe the ear, you like to syringe along the roof of the external auditory meatus because if you go along the floor, this 10th cranial nerve, the vagus, the vagus had a parasympathetic component to it. And if you remember the functions of the parasympathetic system, one of the functions of the parasympathetic system was to act on the gastrointestinal tract. Another function was to decrease the heart rate. Okay. So what happens is that you might be doing something so simple as trying to remove wax from the ear, but you might stimulate this vagus nerve and the person's heart rate will suddenly dip or they might begin to vomit. So that's a very typical thing that might happen. So you have to be very careful. So you want to go along the roof so that you don't stimulate the vagus nerve. Yes. Do they use the syringes when someone has like a severe ear infection? When someone has a severe ear infection, you don't want to, especially... If it is, uh, you can have an external ear infection, which could be like swimmer's ear that you have, which is just because of this area being so moist, you have fungal infection there. This external um, auditory canal is separated. The external ear is separated from this part, the middle ear, by this membrane, which is sort of a wall 
the middle, which is called the tympanic membrane. So they don't connect at all. So whenever you get fluid inside the external auditory canal, when you go swim, the fluid lies here. It cannot go into the middle ear. So it depends on what kind of infection you're talking about. But the, if it is over here, you don't do any syringing. When you have middle ear infection, suppose there is fluid buildup in the middle ear because of whatever condition, then you don't kind of, uh, you do something known as myringotomy. You don't kind of poke a needle and try to draw the fluid out like that. You'll actually have to make a slit in the tympanic membrane to allow that fluid to drain out. Or they put a little tube inside the, called the grommet's tube. You know, ear tube, which is called? Yeah, they put a long tube so that you can drain the fluid from the middle ear cavity. So you'll put that tube through the tympanic membrane. Okay? So this was the external ear. Then when we look at the middle ear cavity, this part is the middle ear. It is separated from this external ear by this membrane, which is known as the tympanic membrane or eardrum in local terms. And this middle ear cavity normally has just got air in it. You don't want any fluid inside because within the middle ear cavity, you have these three really, really tiny bones. These bones are known as collectively as ossicles, ear ossicles. And they are, one is shaped like a hammer. This one is shaped like a hammer. It's called malleus. This one is shaped like an anvil. It's called incus. And this one here is shaped like a stirrup, so it's called stapes. So when sound waves come from here, and this is why in us, of course, we don't need our oracle to really kind of direct the sound waves. But, you know, you've seen in animals when they cock their ear. So what they do is they kind of direct the ear that way so that the sound waves will travel into the external auditory canal. It will pass through here. It will hit the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane begins to vibrate. The vibrations are passed to the malleus, which you can see is articulating with the incus. So then the incus will vibrate, which will then pass to stapes. Stapes will vibrate. And then from here, the stapes is uh, sort of resting against a little window here called the oval window. And so that oval window separates the middle ear from the internal ear. So this is the internal ear. So this will then pass into the internal ear. So can you see how all three parts of the ear are concerned with hearing? Now, I said that the, the middle ear is filled with air. You want it to be filled with air so that these three ossicles can vibrate. Imagine if there was fluid present in the middle ear, what would happen? They cannot vibrate, right? So that's what happens when, and, when, and usually children tend to have an infection of the middle ear, which is called otitis media. Um, then there's the, the sort of the epithelium here begins to secrete fluid. And when it secretes fluid, these ossicles cannot vibrate, apart from the fact that the infection may be bacterial and cause fever and all that, the child then can't hear. Right, And it, the ossicles could get damaged, that, which is why you need to kind of remove that fluid from the middle ear. And you do that by either antibiotics. If they don't help, you have to make a hole in the tympanic membrane. And when you make a hole, you kind of put a little tube like this so that the fluid kind of drains out. Okay? Scar the scar tissue can build up in the tympanic membrane. Um, but, you know, they usually give a clean cut, so very little scar tissue uh, builds up. Now, talking of why would middle ear infections become very common in children, the reason is that this middle ear cavity, on one end it is separated from the external ear by the tympanic membrane. On the other side, it is separated from the internal ear by this oval window, and then we'll see in the next picture there's a little window here called the round window. But the middle ear also communicates with the throat, or what is called the nasopharynx, this is an area of the throat. It communicates with the throat by means of this tube, which is present here called the pharyngotympanic or auditory tube, or if this one is also called the eustachian tube. So another name for it is the eustachian tube. The function of the eustachian tube, I mean, why would it communicate the, I mean, why would it be a communication between the middle ear and the nasopharynx? Because the eustachian tube helps to equalize pressure in the middle ear with the throat and the throat connects to the outside, you know, the nasopharynx through the nose with the outside. You've all seen sometimes, you know, when you go in pressurized aircraft, you kind of feel your ears are blocked and then you have to swallow and then, you know, you can feel that pop and you feel better, right? That's because when you swallow, you kind of open and close this pharyngotympanic tube so that you're equalizing the pressure 
of the middle ear through this pharyngotympanic tube with the throat and then the outside. So that's its function. But because it makes a communication between the throat and the middle ear cavity, in children this pharyngotympanic tube is much shorter and less oblique and wider. So with the result, there's a quick communication between the throat and the middle ear. So if a child gets a sore throat, through the sore throat, the infection can pass into the auditory tube and get into the ear, which is the reason why children tend, whenever they get a cold, very often they end up getting middle ear infections and that's what pediatricians try to prevent. Why not so much in adults? One, whenever we get a sore throat, we take action immediately. Second, in us, the middle ear, uh, the pharyngotympanic tube is much longer, narrower and more oblique, so it doesn't pass that quickly. Okay? Now here is showing you the communication between the middle and the internal ear, so a little bit more sort of enlarged. So here you can see the tympanic membrane which separates the middle ear from the external ear. And here, the middle ear is separated from the internal ear by one is most of it is bone, but there is this window here, which is called the oval window. The stapes has a plate called the foot plate, and this foot plate rests against the oval window. So it goes back and forth against the oval window, and that's how it transmits the impulses to the cochlea, which is for hearing. And then this here is the round window. So impulses pass from here into the cochlea. Now suppose the pressure is too much. What happens is the impulse... Sorry. The impulses can come back like this through this out of this round window. So the round window acts like a safety valve. So these vibrations pass through like this and they get into the cochlea and they stimulate the sense organs in the cochlea and then that goes to the cochlear nerve and you know you hear. But suppose the, the vibrations are too much. You don't want the sensitive organ to get destroyed. So this acts like a little safety valve and so this excess pressure is kind of, you know, brought out. Now here what I also want you to see the parts of the internal ear which we'll discuss. So the internal ear has a bony part and a membranous part. So this what you're looking at is the bony part. So there are two bony parts to it. This snail-like structure is called the cochlea. This is the bony cochlea. And inside it, we'll actually see a membranous duct present. So inside this, we'll actually see a little duct present. So there'll be a little membranous duct inside going all the way, which will be called the cochlear duct. And here, this area here, these three kind of half circles are known as semicircular canals. There are three of them. And this central area is called the vestibule. So again, inside the semicircular canal, you'll have another duct present. Okay, a tube within a tube, so to speak. And inside the vestibule, again, you'll have two structures, which we'll see late, uh, uh, later. So this area, the ducts present in this area are to do with equilibrium. And the nerve which carries equilibrium is the vestibular nerve. And the duct within the cochlea is to do with hearing. Remember, I said cochlea is the one which has the H. And the nerve to do with hearing is the cochlear nerve, okay? So here is the internal ear. So you saw that picture, that bony part that I was describing, this bony part that I was describing, this is known as the bony labyrinth. It's kind of all so, can you see, so um, it's like a maze inside. So it's called the bony labyrinth and it's filled with a fluid known as perilymph. And one example, so just so that you understand what is meant by this perilymph and endolymph and where they are present. So imagine you have this huge pipe and we call, uh, imagine you have this white PVC pipe, okay? That's the bony labyrinth. So this could be part of the cochlea or this could be part of a semicircular canal or the vestibule, it doesn't matter, okay? So you've got this huge pipe and this is, imagine you fill this with fluid which is called perilymph. Now inside this pipe, imagine if you put a little, um, you know, made out of um, thin transparent tube inside like this, okay? Can you see it's a tube within a tube? So this inner tube is what is called the membranous labyrinth, 
which is what is the cochlear duct or what we see as the semicircular duct or we'll see also called the um, saccule and utricle. And this, inside this is a fluid called endolymph. Do you see that? So these ducts are surrounded by perilymph, but inside them they have endolymph. Have you followed? This is what is called the membranous labyrinth. This is what is called the bony labyrinth. Have you followed? Okay. So the bony labyrinth, as you can see, consists of the cochlea, the semicircular canal, and that dilated part which I showed you here, which was known as the vestibule. The membranous labyrinth consists of the cochlea duct, which will be present inside the cochlea. The semicircular duct, which will be present inside the semicircular canal. And there'll be two small structures called the utricle and saccule, which will be present inside this region called the vestibule. Okay? These three areas, the ducts, that means the cochlear, the semicircular, and utricle and saccule, these are the ones which contain the main sense organs to do with hearing or equilibrium. Okay? They are the ones which will contain those special sense organs which will have those bipolar cells. And those sense organs connect to the eighth cranial nerve. Which are those two sense organs? So inside the cochlear duct, the name of the sense organ for hearing is known as the organ of corti. And this is for hearing. It will go with the cochlear part of the eighth cranial nerve and hearing goes to the temporal lobe. Inside the semicircular canal is a part, the sense of uh, equilibrium is through a special sense organ called crista ampullaris. And this is responsible for something known as dynamic equilibrium. What is meant by dynamic equilibrium is rotational equilibrium. That is, you know, imagine you were spinning around. You know, that to maintain your equilibrium when you're kind of rotating around, that is a function of this sense organ called crista ampullaris. That is what is meant by dynamic equilibrium. And inside this saccule and utricle, the special sense organ present there is known as the macula. That is responsible for static equilibrium. Static equilibrium is equilibrium in a linear direction. The I, example I can give you is, imagine you're tr sitting in a car and you're driving and you suddenly stop. You know how your head kind of moves forwards like that? So that is called static equilibrium. And then you know you, how you can kind of maintain your, your balance in that. So that is what is meant as, so it's a linear motion and dynamic equilibrium is a rotational motion. So don't kind of think too much about this. So there are just two types of maintaining balance. One is when you're going round and round. And the other one is when your movement of your head is in a linear direction. Okay. So both of these connect to the vestibular part of the eighth cranial nerve, which takes it to the cerebellum. Okay. So let's do a little bit of review. So the temporal lobe, based on what you learned so far, what kind of sensations does the temporal lobe uh, receive? Okay, I see that I have a... I should have had an extra answer up here. Okay. I see myself that my question is wrong. You. Yes, exactly. It should be B and C because it's for smell and hearing. I just realized I didn't put that, right? So it should be B and C, smell and hearing. So yeah, I can see how some of you got confused. So it should be this. Taste, remember, goes to parietal lobe and the insula, okay? Smell and hearing. So I really should have had B and C. So I'll put that B and C and this one is the correct answer, okay? Okay. What does the tympanic membrane separate?
Very good. Middle ear from the external ear. It doesn't uh, separate the middle from the internal. That was, remember, bone and the two windows. And external ear from the internal ear, you have the middle ear in between the two. Okay, so it's the, the tympanic membrane separates the middle ear from the external ear. So here, let's look at the inner ear or internal ear and we look at the bony labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth. So this in beige is the bony part. So here you can see this is the cochlea. And inside the cochlea, notice this tube present here. You know, this was the transparent tube that I was talking about. This is known as the duct. So you can see cochlea, duct in cochlea. Then here, this is the semicircular canal. And you can see the semicircular ducts present inside the semicircular canals. And towards where they open into this area, you can see that they are dilated. And this is known as the crista ampullaris. So this part here is the crista ampullaris. <laughs> so here's the crista ampullaris, which you can see, this area here, this part here. And then notice in this area, this bony part is called the vestibule. Inside that you have this called the utricle and this area called the saccule. So these are present in the vestibule. So notice that these structures, the semicircular duct, the saccule and the utricle, and you can see these special purple colored things. These are, these are what have the macula and this is the crista ampullaris. So these are what contain the sense organs. And inside here, the cochlear duct will have the organ of corti. Okay. So here you can see inside the cochlea, you have the cochlear duct, which has this special organ called organ of co corti, which connects to the cochlear nerve and this is responsible for hearing. In the semicircular canal, you have the semicircular ducts, which contain this crista ampullaris, which sends dynamic equilibrium, that means rotational movement, and they connect with the vestibular nerve, which goes to the cerebellum. Inside the vestibule, you have the saccule and the utricle, which have the special sense organ called the macula, maculae is plural, which are responsible for motion in a linear fashion. And they again connect to the vestibular nerve because both of them are for equilibrium. Okay, so this is all that I want you to know on, on this. So, you know, don't kind of overthink this part. So this is just showing you how the cochlea, uh, or it shows you this organ of corti. So remember I said it was like a tube within a tube. So imagine this is the bony cochlea. And if you kind of put a tube inside, and so if you... Imagine if you had this big tube like this, this was the PVC pipe, and inside this PVC pipe we kind of put another tube, and this tube we actually imagine we put it somewhere in the middle, uh, somewhere on the side like that, and we also had bone connecting like this, okay? So can you see it kind of divides this whole area into three, one, two, three. Three. Can you see that? It divides it into three parts. Okay. So that's what this picture is kind of trying to show you. So here it shows you that this is this bony PVC pipe, this black one. Here we've put in this little duct inside, which is the cochlear duct, which is this. Can you see that? And here's the bone. So we now actually have almost like three cavities, you know, three tubes inside, three spaces made. So these three spaces just have different names. The space on the top and the space on the bottom are the bony part. The space in the middle is this one which is the membranous part and this is the one which is going to contain that special organ of corti. This top part is called scala vestibuli which contains perilymph. This bottom part is called scala tympani which contains perilymph because remember in this PVC pipe we had perilymph, right? And in the central area, this one, this part is called scala tympana, uh, scala media. And this is the one which contains endolymph because this is the one which has the, which is the duct and which will have the sense organ. So here is that special sense organ which is present, which is called the organ of corti. So this is known as the spiral organ of corti. And it has bipolar nerve cells. So you can see these nerve cells kind of rest on a membrane up here. And they also have a membrane here which kind of separates them from this top part here. This membrane separates from them from this bottom part. So imagine if 
vibrations were to pass into this top area or the bottom area what they will do is as these will move these membranes move back and forth they will kind of stimulate see they either sort of make this thing vibrate like this when it does that the bipolar neurons are stimulated and then they take the impulses to the cochlear nerve and then from there it goes all the way to the temporal lobe for hearing okay yes is there a way to tell the difference between the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani without using the tympani membrane as your origination point the tympanic membrane is not related to this at all remember tympanic membrane separates the external ear from the middle ear we are talking about the internal ear there's the well in the, i'm just thinking about the lab in the model the model shows one area well in the in the lab if it's showing you this over here it's not going to show you the tympanic membrane because tympanic membrane is on the outside it separates middle ear from the external ear we are now in the inside the in, inner ear this is called scala tympani but it has nothing to do with tympanic membrane okay so hopefully it would be present in an anatomical position so one way to tell is that if you look up here can you see this organ of corti it is resting on a membrane up here which is called the basal membrane which is the one which separates it from scala tympani when you look up here there is there is this space and then you have this other membrane which is known as the tech, um this part is called the uh, vestibular membrane which separates it from scala vestibular can you see this gap so between the organ of corti and scala tympani is just one layer but between the organ of corti and the scala vestibular you have a space and then you have this membrane so that's how you're going to tell in the lab okay well when they do a cochlear implant obviously uh, these hair cells have been damaged you know so at that point what they do is they kind of put uh, they'll have to put they can't um, i mean they'll put something which will connect with the cochlear nerve cells and that which will take out the which will take the impulses out now whether they replace the entire cochlea or they go in and kind of just sorry they go in and kind of just go at this point i i'm not sure Now here's how sound waves pass. So I I showed you this out. So imagine if you kind of take this cochlea here, you know, you saw how the cochlea and even if we go back here, it's kind of sort of all in a, you know, sort of been rolled around. But can you see when you go like this and you go all the way to the top, the scala tympani and the scala vestibular actually become continuous with one another around this point here. So if we were to unroll this whole thing and show that this whole thing is one, you know, before rolling. So can you see scala vestibuli comes here and becomes scala tympani right like that, okay? So sound waves will pass from here from the external auditory canal, vibration set up in the tympanic membrane, pass through the three ossicles, the from the stapes through the round uh, through the oval window it will pass here. Can you go up? It will stimulate this membrane which will stimulate the organ of corti also when it comes turns around here it will stimulate this basal membrane which will again stimulate the organ of corti and that's how you know impulses will be carried out through the cochlear nerve if the pressure is too much can you see through this round window that is like a release valve so you know the pressure comes out into the middle ear through that okay so let's look at this passage of sound waves which might make it a little bit clearer Sound waves are gathered by the pinna and directed down the auditory canal to the eardrum or tympanic membrane. The mechanical energy sound causes vibrate. In turn, causes vibrate three middle ears. First, the malleus, then the incus, and finally the stapes. These tiny bones amplify the vibrations. The stapes comes in contact with the inner ear at the oval window. The fluid-filled inner ear is a coil structure called the cochlea. Vibrations conveyed to the fluid cause bending of hair cells. If we examine this cross-section of the the tectorial neck can be seen at the top. In it are embedded the tips of hair cells, which are shown in certain yellow. 
vibration and by the neurons, their face changes. Those are conveyed to the brain and received as sound. So you can see how those cells were stimulated. The same needs to be stimulated, but here they will pass out to go to the vestibular part of the eighth cranial nerve, and we have different structures which are concerned with it. So, in the case of um, the saccule and the utricle, you have this structure called the macula in it, and this is how the macula is. So, these are those hair cells which connect with these bipolar neurons. On the surface of it, these hair cells have like a thick gelatinous material called the otolithic membrane, which has calcium deposits on it just to keep it kind of pressed. So imagine, like I said, that if you were sitting in a car driving and you suddenly stopped, you know how your head kind of jerks forward? So when it does that, can you understand this otolithic membrane will kind of slide forward like that? When it slides forward, what it will do is it will distort these hair cells. Can you see that? So when it distorts these hair cells, these will stimulate these uh, nerve fibers, go to the vestibular nerve, and then they will go to the cerebellum. So this is kind of in a linear fashion. On the other hand, look at this when someone is rotating like this. This is seen in the crista, which is part of the semicircular duct. So this is rotational movement, which is known as dynamic equilibrium. So again, this is in a um, this is present in a, a special sense organ, which is known as crista ampullaris. So again, the the way it's structured is a little different. So uh, you but you still have hair cells. You have this area which is called the ampullary. Cupula, these come out into neurons which will go to the vestibular nerve. So look at this girl, you know, she's rotating like this. When she does that, the endolymph, the fluid inside circulates and it kind of bends this, this way. When it bends it, it stimulates the hair cells which stimulate the vestibular nerve and, you know, then one can perceive this rotational movement. So that, that basically is. So what I want you to know is that in both, where these sense organs are present, which nerve carries these sensations? What is the type of sensation which is carried? In case of cochlea, for example, it was hearing. In the case of the crista and the macula, it was sense of equilibrium. And here it was the vestibular nerve. And this goes to the cerebellum. Okay? And static equilibrium, like I said, it was equilibrium or sense of balance in a linear direction. Uh, dynamic equilibrium means in a rotational direction. So that's pretty much what I want you to know in this. So macula was linear and crystal was rotational. Yes.